Welcome in everybody for episode five. Today we have an interesting video I've been wanting to do. Um, I did some research about fasting and facts about fasting. And what I found on social media was all of these videos about people having trouble sleeping when they're trying to fast. And I thought a lot about this and I spoke with Dr. Whiting about it. And it's truly fa a fascinating subject now, all of a sudden, even more so because of what I found. And there's all these people claiming that when they fast, they all of a sudden either can't sleep or they can't sleep enough and continue to get woken up. Now, personally, I've fasted. Personally, you've used fasting. I still you've, use it. Yeah, and I, you've helped people. I still use fasting. And I've never, as a matter of fact, I have slept. I already, <laughs> I already was a, a, an amazing sleeper as it is. But, but, but after fasting, I became a, an award-winning sleeper. <laughs> so it, it confuses me. And go ahead and tell them what your thoughts are on it. Well, here's the deal. For a little bit of background, the human being, the human body, has been fasting for thousands and thousands of years. Yeah. Not so much for any other reason than necessity. Our ancestors were hunters, gatherers. They were, uh, when, they, when they shot game, everybody ate. And when they didn't shoot game, nobody ate. And that's just the way life was. There was no refrigeration. There was no knowledge of how to preserve anything. And so they ate and ate and ate, and then they didn't eat. And so genetically, we are naturally predisposed to a fasting cycle. Now, that having been said, fast forward to today. And uh, our modern society and our hedonistic uh, self-gratification society. Yeah. And let's say, for example, when, when our ancestors fasted, they ate meat, grains, fruits, berries, so on. Today, when we fast, we eat the same crap that we did when we weren't fasting. Yeah. Now, you can't fast for 12 hours. Well, 12 hours isn't fasting. Come on. We all go to bed at 10 o'clock and we all get up at, at uh, 6 or 7. That's darn near 12 hours already. Yeah. And nobody seems to have trouble sleeping. But then we push it to 16 or 18 hours, so forth. I personally uh, fast 24 hours at a time, except on Saturday and Sunday. So five days a week, I eat one meal every 24 hours. And my blood sugar, my blood pressure, my ability to sleep have all improved dramatically. So why are these people having trouble sleeping? Uh, why are they irritable uh, when they fast? Well, it all comes down to a common denominator, and that is the junk food diet. You can't have a window of eating. Let's say you have a two hour window or a four hour window and some programs even have an eight hour window per day. Well, you can't fill that window with garbage because the fasting is not going to overcome that degree of dietary offense and abuse. And so rather than using a, uh, our fasting as a tool towards better health, towards weight management, which by the way, it's very effective for, um, we use it and expect it to do everything. We expect it to eradicate all our dietary sins, allow us to eat whatever we want, drink whatever we want, and just because we're fasting, uh, we're going to be healthy. Yeah. Not true. Not true at all. So. But if people were to eat decent, eat healthy, 
during the non-fasting period, they likely would not have all of these other problems because the majority of problems comes from fluctuating blood sugar. Yeah. And when you eat garbage full of sugar and refined carbohydrates and then don't eat anything for 12 or 14 or 16 or 18 hours, what do you suppose is going to happen to your blood sugar? Yeah. It's going to take a dive. And that's going to stop you from sleeping. Exactly. One of the quickest ways to wake up in the middle of the night is when your blood sugar falls. Yeah, when you're hungry. Yeah. So in, in layman's terms, what you're saying is what I found out. People are eating like crap and then going, oh, I now want to just fast for 10 hours the next day. Yeah, and that'll, when that'll you, solve all my problems. Yeah, like, but the thing is, is what you taught me 10 years ago, now even 11, 12 years ago, it you have to get, you have to be able to figure out, first of all, figure out if you're carbohydrate intolerant or calorie sensitive, and then get into a good healthy get in some ha habits that are healthier yep. get the balanced blood sugar then fast you can't just go from eating the way you want and you think you can and then all of a sudden fasting that's why all these videos are getting all the views because they're going oh well now i can't sleep well you're starving yeah exactly because you didn't balance your blood sugar that's right so the next question is is fasting safe absolutely it is it is one of the oldest and most health beneficial techniques that we have. It, the human body was not meant to eat constantly. Yeah. Digestion takes four to six hours. Hmm. And before you've digested the first meal, millions of people are already stuffing their face with more food. Yeah. And that's just not, so the digestive system never gets to actually rest. It's not healthy. It, it's, it's a myth that Eating constantly is, is beneficial. It's not. Yeah. So do you think it's a viable... So you're saying it is a viable tool for weight loss and overall health? Absolutely. As long as you don't abuse it when you're not fasting. And so the funny thing that I brought up about fasting is that I don't think a lot of people realize. Let's say even a person in California who has three jobs just to make all the bills... Or let's say a person just has a hectic life. You know, you got the family, you got the kids, you don't have time. Let's say you're not eating dinner until 9 p.m. Then at 11, you go to bed. Then you wake up at 7 a.m. You had no trouble sleeping then, and that's how many hours? That's eight. See, there you go. That's So to me, that's sleeping is kind of like fasting in a way. I mean, well, yeah, because yeah, it's hard to eat when you're asleep. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. It just depends on the whole package. You cannot expect that just because you are entertaining fasting, that it's going to solve, eradicate, and remove every other dietary sin that you uh, practice. It's just not. And it, that goes back to the thing about carbohydrate intolerant people. If, if they want to start losing weight, they got to do the limiting the carbs for at least a couple months before getting into fasting. That's right. We use at, at our weight management program, we use intermittent fasting in the later stages, not early on. Yeah. Because we have to establish metabolic identity. We have to establish uh, metabolic Pattern. Uh, patterns and, 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 and consumption before we go that far. Yeah. So there it is. It, 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 you can't go from your trash diet right into the next day fasting because you're going to be looking at those videos on, 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 on different social media and going, yeah. hey, I can't sleep That's either. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if, if, if my blood sugar was on a roller coaster, I don't think I'd be sleeping very deeply either. <laughs> What, a, what an eye-opening subject that is. Symptoms of magnesium deficiency. Another one that we've been dying to do and we got you got some notes on it. First off, what I see out there the most, and I, I, I kind of have, have done a little bit of research even further than we started, and it seems that Gen X 
is now the women of Gen X are now hitting the menopause age. Yep. And what I've noticed on social media and even articles is they're looking for relief and they're finding out that magne magnesium citrate and magnesium glyconate is two different magnesiums, which is mind blowing to me. So what's the difference? Well, it's one magnesium, it's one mineral with two different chelates. Huh. And the chelation of them makes them absorbable and able to be utilized in different ways. Um, so let's start with magnesium citrate. Well, citrate, which is a, a chelated by citric acid, is an ideal form of magnesium to take during the day. Now, let's talk just briefly about what magnesium does. First of all, it's an electrolyte. It's opposite of calcium. So, for example, calcium causes muscles to contract. Magnesium causes them to relax. Okay. So, for example, if you have tremors, leg cramps, especially at night, uh, it's very likely, although there are other causes for that, but it's very likely that you have a magnesium-calcium imbalance and you're probably more deficient in magnesium than calcium. Uh, magnesium is such an essential mineral. It is responsible for uh, uh, regulating blood pressure, blood sugar. Uh, it produces, it's involved in the Krebs cycle, producing energy. Uh, it keeps the nerves working smoothly, which is necessary when you have to have a contraction and a relaxation. Uh, it's involved in protein synthesis. Uh, without that, you have a whole host of problems. And of course, along with calcium, it's involved with bone and tooth strength. Uh, so magnesium citrate is ideal to take in the morning because it helps to provide the magnesium you need for those types of experiences, those types of benefits. So everything you just said is magnesium citrate. Well, they're interchangeable, but Magnesium citrate is more bioavailable uh, during the day. Okay. Now we go to magnesium glycinate. Glycinate uh, is a chelate and it helps to induce relaxation. So think of when you contract a muscle and then you relax it. Relax it. So it is, calcium is a relaxing uh, muscle, uh, muscle relaxer. And uh, Glycinate helps induce uh, deeper, uh, more restful sleep. Hmm. So glycinate should be taken in the evening, approximately an hour before you go to bed. With food or without? It doesn't matter, usually. Okay. Um, some people are more sensitive to magnesium than other, and it can create bowel disturbances. So you may want to start with a lower dose of magnesium, Low you know, 50, 100 milligrams. Uh, and see how your system responds and allow it to get used to it. Uh, but there's so many potential deficiency symptoms. How would you know if you're deficient in magnesium? Well, how about muscle cramps, fatigue, uh, irregular heartbeat, mood swings, uh, osteoporosis, type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases? Uh, that should give you an idea how important magnesium is uh, in your diet. Yeah, it, it, it's so fascinating that it, that it when, we, when we were doing the research on this, the, the heart part of it and, the, and the, uh, the leg shaking at night part and how those things work, you know what I mean? Oh, it, it's, it's what people don't realize because, and, and it's a cultural thing, when we talk about supplements, and if I want to know if you take supplements, nine times out of ten, people are going to say, hey, do you take vitamins? Okay. What they mean is do you take a dietary supplement? Yeah. And they're not the same. Because vitamins, there's only 17 of them, yet there are 100 essential nutrients. Oh, okay. I okay. see what you're so, saying. But our mindset is 
Do you take vitamins? I take my vitamin. I take my one a day vitamin. I take my vitamin yeah, drink but that's every not day. Complete. But it's not complete. Yeah. And the truth be known that the largest group of minerals or nutrients rather uh, that are essential for well-being are the minerals. Uh, there are at least fifty-six of them. And uh, so, we, magnesium is a mineral and an electrolyte. Yes, it is an electrolyte mineral. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, along with calcium, potassium, and, and chloride, and others. Um, and so, when you have uh, a mineral deficiency, it help. It, it actually retards the body's ability to utilize vitamins. Mm. So it, they they should always go hand in hand. Uh, and the micro trace elements, uh, which we've talked about before and probably should do again uh, one day, is uh, the largest group. And those are responsible, they're what we call catalysts. They make other things happen in the body. And without them, a lot of thousands of biochemical actions that are necessary for optimal wellness uh, either don't occur or they don't occur effectively. So what kind of lifestyles would contribute to magnesium deficiency? Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, a diet that's not rich in, 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 in calcium and magnesium. No. And the problem is, is that uh, for decades, people got along drinking dairy milk yeah. as calcium, as a magnesium. But that's fallen out of favor simply because uh, after age 50, it's very difficult to digest milk because it, it's a product that was made for infants. It mm. wasn't made for old people. So we really have no business drinking milk after 15 or 16 years of age. Yeah. Um, what, what might you look for uh, if you suspect a vita, uh, magnesium Does deficiency? Does overconsumption, since it's an electrolyte, wouldn't overconsumption of even water deplete magnesium? Yes. So overconsumption of alcohol. Anything that's a diuretic. Yeah. So even alcohol. Alcohol, caffeine, water to excess. So even under people between twenty and fifty also maybe could, could fall victim to magnesium deficiency. Even as well. some of those people could benefit yeah, from magnesium. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So how do you know if you might have a magnesium deficiency? Well, twitches leg cramps, numbness, um, general overall weakness, irregular heartbeat, heart palpitations, constipation, nausea, vomiting, mm. loss of appetite, and headaches. Hmm. Okay, so when people think of magnesium, for example, me, when I think of magnesium, I think of it as a partner to calcium. As well it should be. So do those if someone's looking into this, do they look for a product that has both or does it matter? Uh, it does matter uh, because you don't want excess calcium over magnesium. You don't want excess magnesium over calcium, except in very strange and interesting biological circumstances. The average general rule is uh, you want to have two parts calcium to one part magnesium. Mm. So if you're taking 500 milligrams of calcium, you want 250 milligrams of chelated calcium uh, because uh, magnesium has a stronger electrical potential than calcium, so you need less of it in relationship to calcium. Mm. Now, once you've got your calcium-magnesium ratios, which you should be able to get with a good full-spectrum multi-supplement, then if you, for whatever individual reasons, need extra magnesium, you can feel free to take it and uh, you don't have to worry about calcium depletion. And so the, the, what I brought up about Gen X, why is Gen X, the, the women of Gen X, they're hitting menopause and they're being told that they need the magnesium glyconate what is the purpose that the that the one that of the symptoms of menopause is sleep disturbance okay uh, as hormones fluctuate up and down uh, it can wake a lady up 
numerous times in the night. And so taking... Hot flashes. I mean, there's nothing like a good night's sleep being interrupted by a hot flash. Yeah. So <laughs> magnesium glyconate is going to help them sleep better. Yes. That's mainly the reason. Yes. And help to manage cortisol. Yes. Because it is a natural cortisol suppressant. Wow. And cortisol, of course, is the stress hormone that does all kinds of nasty things to us when we have an excessive amount. Yeah. How about shingles? Shingles is a, a topic that you see quite often, a lot of different places. Um, I actually just got a text from the pharmacy the other day reminding me that they have a, sh a shingles vaccine, vaccine available. Um, shingles is in the herpes virus family. Mm -hmm. And to start off with, I guess, let's say what is shingles? Shingles is a uh, member of the uh, herpes virus, of which there are three main uh, strains. One is herpes simplex. That's when you get a cold sore yeah, on cold your sore, lip. Yeah. Okay. The next one is genital herpes, uh, which is transmitted sexually. Yeah. And then last, of course, is shingles or what is properly called herpes zoster. And it is by far uh, the most uncomfortable experience of the three. Um, is it related to chicken pox or something? Yes. Okay. The chicken pox virus and herpes zoster are pretty much parallel. Yeah. So, so I, in other words, if you had chicken pox as a kid. Yeah, I did. You've got the herpes zoster virus in your body. Great. Well, that's now, not good. <laughs> now, why don't we get cold sores like every week? Uh, why don't we all get shingles like every month? Because your immune system's because in there fighting. Because your immune system is suppressing the virus. Huh. When you get overtired, overstressed, you eat poorly, you don't get enough sleep, and all those factors start to build up, that's when you'll notice you get a cold sore. Mm -hmm. That's why they call them cold sores, because they come on just before you get your cold. Oh. But it's, 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 they're not, it's not related to the cold virus. It's just that the cold virus is now going to suppress your immune system temporarily. Because you're stressed. And it's going to cause the herpes simplex or cold sore virus to multiply. So what you're saying is can stress can contribute to that. Oh, for sure. Stress is so the can stress one cause of everything. Can stress contribute to getting shingles back then? Yes. Oh. Yes. Most people, uh, when they get an outbreak of shingles will say that they've been under physical and or emotional stress. Oh. So what are the natural ways to combat shingles? To me, it sounds to me like you would be one of taking calcium, magnesium, mm -hmm. B-complex, mm -hmm. panathenic acid. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else and I'm missing? And more specifically, when you feel an outbreak or notice an outbreak as soon as possible, you want to start taking the uh, uh, the amino acid L-lysine. L-lysine. And you want to take this at 1,000 milligrams three or four times a day. And that's L-L-Y-S-I-N-E. Uh, -E. L-lysine. It's available in any health food store. It's available online at Amazon or any anywhere else. Okay. So it doesn't matter where you get it from. No. Uh, but you want to take 1,000 milligrams. If you do that quick enough... Um, you can usually uh, suppress the situation. Why? Because the herpes virus needs certain amino acids to multiply. Okay. Lysine mimics those amino acids. It's very close. It's like a couple of molecules away. Okay. So when you have high lysine, the virus attaches to the lysine and dies. Wow. Because it can't replicate when it binds with lysine. Fascinating. So that's why it works, essentially. Huh. What else can you do to, let's say you didn't catch it in time with the L-lysine. What else can you do if you have the shingles outbreak? Besides do the stuff that your doctor recommends. Yeah, I mean, at that point, if it's severe enough, you're going to be looking at having to take antiviral medication. 
Oh, okay. So like antibiotics? No, antivirals. Oh, okay. Uh, herpes is a virus, not a bacteria. Got it. Huh. Fascinating. The truth about cholesterol. Here we go. Yeah, you bet. Here we go. I got, <laughs> I got a couple of, of, of facts that I want to say first um, before I ask the question. I did some research and I found the majority of cholesterol in your body is made up by your liver. Mm -hmm. And the brain contains about 20% of the whole body's cholesterol. Yeah. Which is sounds weird to me. So cholesterol is in my brain. Yeah, I hope Makes so. Makes up part of it. <laughs> and brain cholesterol is deeply involved in the synapsis development, the lipid composition of the myelin sheath, and the, the, the lipid composition of the myelin sheath is made up of high amounts of cholesterol. So why does the medical industry hate cholesterol so much? Well, that goes back to a little history lesson. After World War, or about during World War II, medical science began to notice an increase in a particular cardiovascular disease called atherosclerosis, hmm. which is the narrowing of the arteries uh, in specific spots. During the Vietnam War, autopsies done on young cadavers dead soldiers dead soldiers in their 20s already showed slight occlusion of the arteries okay and upon dissection it was discovered that the sticky yellow substance gluing gluing to the artery was in fact cholesterol so Every year since then, heart disease has increased exponentially. Uh, you may hear, and it's wrong, but you may hear that uh, we are winning the war on heart disease. We are not. Every single year, heart disease incidence increases. It has never, ever once decreased. More people are living with heart disease because of medical intervention stints, bypass, etc. But the incidence of heart disease has never declined. So without getting into a really long discussion, what is the cause of this problem? Well, it's, it's our little friend, the free radical. Okay. Free radicals, primarily free those- Free radical are, damage. Yeah, primarily coming from rancid vegetable oils, the kind we've been told forever are healthy, um, damage the DNA of the inner muscle wall of your artery. Uh, that causes those cells sort of a pseudo-cancer situation uh, where the cells of the muscle wall begin to multiply extensively. This puts pressure on the uh, inner wall of the artery. And the body says, hey, if this goes on a whole lot longer, I'm going to blow a hose and that's going to be it, over and out. And so the body in its wisdom begins to lay down a uh, substance called fibrinogen, which is a rather sticky substance, but it's, it's the body's bandage. Once that's laid down, calcium, which is floating through your system, hopefully, is ionically or electrically attracted to the fibrinogen. So wherever that is laid down, that's where calcium is gonna go and stick to it. Hmm. So it's kind of like a layer cake. Once the calcium is stuck to the artery, cholesterol, which is a normal, healthy, essential substance, floats by and it is ionically attracted to the calcium. Mm. And it's so, like a row of dominoes. Yeah, and so it begins to build up. So when these doctors sliced open these arteries and did their autopsies, they saw cholesterol. They never bothered to think or look to see why it was there. Because you can have a 70, 80, 90% blockage at one point in your artery and an inch away, two inches away, it's perfectly clear. 
Yeah. So what's happening at those junctures? Damage from free radicals. So now let's, let me give you something logical to think about. The medical industry thinks that high cholesterol causes heart disease. Wrong. Hmm. Cholesterol has never caused one case of heart disease in medical history. It can complicate things only if your arteries become calcified. So let's say your cholesterol level is 300. Everybody panics, okay? And they give you diet suggestions which rarely work and then they give you the good old statin drugs which have so many side effects it isn't even believable yeah. that medicine would use these things. And that statin drug damages your liver and forces the cholesterol way down, often below healthy levels. And now supposedly you're at a much lower risk for heart disease. Well, how does that work? It doesn't matter if your cholesterol is 200, 300, 600, 100. If there's any cholesterol in your body, in your, in your blood, and there darn well better be, um, if it's gonna to stick to the artery, it's gonna to stick to the artery. Hmm. The, the adhesion of, of cholesterol to calcified junctures has nothing to do with the amount of cholesterol. It has something to do with, the free with radicals. arterial damage, which originally started with free radicals, primarily from polyunsaturated oils. Got it. All right, well, it looks like we're gonna to have to do another video about uh, cholesterol that goes a little bit further in depth because that didn't answer all my questions, but at least that gave me enough to think about until next week when we do another cholesterol and dive even deeper in.